so that we might speak. Speak, Lord, so that we might live. Your voice brings us life. Your voice brings us joy. Your voice and your word form all that is and all that was and all that ever shall be. We're tongue-tied and stumbling. Our words are both too much and somehow not enough. And so we seek to be shaped by your soothing language. Speak to us of gratitude, that foreign language with its curious nouns and verbs. How long has it been since we soaked in the deep waters of thankfulness, praise, grace, appreciation? How long since we ran towards giving thanks, bestowing grace, writing thank you notes, pronouncing a blessing? Ill practice that we are, let us try out a few words. God, we give you thanks for new life. There's been a flow of babies in the congregation that has brought great joy. We name names like Sal, Witt, and John Patrick. Parents like Mark and Elizabeth, Andrew and Ali, Cameron and Rebecca. We praise you that you are forever creating life, even in a deathly pandemic. And so we pronounce a blessing on the babies. May they have wisdom and courage. May they be safe from illness and great harm. May they discover joy. May they teach us how to be grateful again. And is that enough, Lord? In a world struggling to live and to breathe and to find grace, is that enough? For today, that we are trying to name a few things that have filled our hearts with gratitude. In your grace, may it be enough. In the name of Jesus, who is more than enough, who is all, and in all, and for all, and who teaches us to pray the Lord's Prayer that we'll say together now. I invite you to say it with us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite all the boys and girls who are here today to come up front and join me on the stairs. Uh, and let's make sure that we keep a good distance between us because we've got some extra folks with us today. So if you are sitting next to your brother or sister, make sure that you guys are away from the other brothers and sisters, okay? And I think that's good. Erin and Maria, why don't y'all... Our Joseph and Reverend, y'all feel a little bit, and Aaron and Maria, y'all feel a little bit together, and we look great. Hey, great job on your facing, you guys. Are you ready to see? Now, today, oh, thank you for the chart. So today, um, I wanted to start by showing you a video. A video during the children's summer. Can you even, can you even believe that? When have we ever done this? It's like high tech, right? Did I just set myself up for it not to work? We'll see. I'll talk about the little bigger. Okay, so. Can you see that? This is from Exodus. Have you guys ever seen Exodus? I'm on this one. This is Professor Xavier. Look at the thing on his head. Oh my goodness. You know what's happening? He's connecting to the minds of all these other people. So with this thing on it says called Cerebro, it gets to connect to all these people everywhere, all these different people. See how different everyone is? Young, old, whatever. He gets to connect them. Isn't that extraordinary? Look, everybody's getting really excited. This is something new. It's cool, right? Yeah, a little bit. So we've been watching some Marvel movies. Then we're talking about Dr. Strange. Now that I actually, I love X-Men. 
And what I was thinking today about our um, our scripture that um, uh, Pastor, uh, that Steve talked about, he was usually going to preach right today, and he's talking about our scripture, and talk, it's a little bit different today. So we're talking about a little bit of things that people are going to be, we're pointing out a difference that people in the early church had. And one difference was the way that they were kind of different from each other. Some people ate one way, and some people didn't eat that way, because some people were Jewish, and some people were not. And they were going Gentile. There was this difference. Sometimes people say different is good or different is bad. Different doesn't have to be one way or the other. And in fact, this Andrew wants to say that the differences are good. They're good things that can connect us. Almost like we saw, uh, we saw Professor Xavier connecting to everyone. Put that thing on his head and he's like, whoa, these connections are so good. Everybody's so different. This is really good. So I'm going to show you that. In our scripture today, you can hear people talking about what they're eating and what they're doing. And maybe some people are thinking this is one way or another for differences. They're good. Okay? What you think about that? Now you think about a book that I was reading this week in New Testament. And it's called The Misunderstood Jew. And it says the church and sin of the Jewish Jesus. Ooh, how about that for another book? Now, in this book, this author starts to talk about Jesus and how people in the early church, remember, that was where Jesus was, right? He was there, and they were pretty much all Jewish. So they all ate this different way. But anyway, let's go on. So these differences can be good. And um, one thing that this person in this book said to me that I thought about and I was thinking about it, she's talking about how many things can be good and can be connected. Even in our differences, differences between Jewish people and Christian people. So different religions, we can think of these differences as connecting us. So I brought my kaleidoscope because sometimes we might think about differences in one way. But if we let God help us with thinking about these differences, we can think about how we're different and we are apart. But in those differences, we can help to connect to each other. So to make you think about that, I have a little activity for y'all to do. You guys are going to make some bridges out of two different things. Two things and marshmallows. And you're going to see how these two different things, fully different, right? Marshmallows are completely different from two things. They're really hard, pointy, they're really soft. And these two different things, in their differences can come together and make something really good. And we can always come together as children of God. Even though we're so different, we can connect with each other in extraordinary ways if we remember that Jesus can help us do that. We can look at our differences as good and connect to each other with Jesus, because he's our bridge. Okay, guys? So I have these on the pews up there, and if you're at home, you can get marshmallows and toothpicks, or if you are little, you can get some spaghetti noodles and break them apart, and you can use those to connect your marshmallows. Or you can use gum drops, or gum candy, and then you can eat them, get them on the back side. Huh? No, I want you to make a bridge, and then you need some marshmallows. If your parents say, okay, okay, okay. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, thank you for the things that make us different. Help us to remember that you made all of us as different as we may be. And in you, we can be connected in extraordinary good ways. Help us to let you lead us and to always remember how much you love us all. In your name we pray, amen. All right, let's go. You guys grab your... Grab your thing and scratch your name off. <laughs>
obedience to the word of God in your life. A reading from Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you shall be such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see a great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophets, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words of that prophet, that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded of the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Here ends the first prophet. Dietary customs were controversial in the Corinthian church. However, love for God and one another informs how the church handles controversies. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now, concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, daily is defied. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others seek you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family, wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some of us have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ was destroyed, Friends, we're in the middle of a pre-recorded sermon, and I just realized that the entire passage is repeated twice. And so, rather than profane the reading of the scripture, um, I'm just going to read the last verse and acknowledge that I bumbled it in my apologies to Steve. This happens sometimes. Here's how Paul ends it. With your forgiveness and grace. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never be meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Here ends the second lesson. These are the kinds of things that happen when you preach humility. I'm not a real big country music fan. But I'm a 
cold night in February 1977, I joined about 7,000 other folks to hear Dolly Parton and Matt Davis in concert. They had just enough crossover to appeal to the college crowd in our brand new arena that was built while I was in college and that my tuition dollars paid for. Mac Davis's career was taking off. He had his own variety show, and a nationwide tour with Dolly Parton wasn't going to hurt his popularity at all. He had a number of hits already, but a couple of years later, one of his songs, released in 1980, poked gentle fun at the celebrity lifestyle he was enjoying. It went like this. I won't sing it, although we could. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. <laughs> to know me is to love me. I must be a heck of a man. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. Most of us don't have to worry about coping with the over-the-top adulation that comes with being a celebrity. I have, however, begun to suspect that American Christianity suffers from a humility problem. Somewhere along the way, we discarded the biblical picture of Jesus as a humble servant, relegating that picture to the lyrics of sentimental hymns. And we replaced it with an image that combines the best of Rambo with a Marvel superhero and just a thin veneer of Christian piety. Super Jesus doesn't need to appear meek and mild-mannered anymore. He can take off his glasses. He can no longer afford to hide his big muscles under those ancient Mediterranean robes. There are, after all, battles to be fought in the culture wars against opponents who have to be godless because they disagree with us. If I were a historian of American religion rather than a humble biblical scholar, I might be able to trace the development of that transformation. What I'm afraid of is that it's merely the logical conclusion of many years of an unholy alliance between Christian fundamentalism and reactionary politics. That alliance that taught the religious right how to take over denominations. And I'm afraid that by now some fundamentalists have figured out that ecclesiastical power just isn't petty enough. I'll admit, my irony sensor is extra sensitive these days. Perhaps because I see so many people on the nightly news that just seem to be irony challenged. So I'm very aware of the dangers of donning a robe and a skull and climbing into a pulpit to preach a sermon about becoming more humble. I'll blame the topic at least on the lectionary. The content, I'll have to take responsibility for. As I ponder today's reading from 1 Corinthians 8, it seems to me that one affirmation and one question might be helpful guides to a more humble and more faithful behavior along our Christian journey. The affirmation is, it's possible I could be wrong. It's possible I could be wrong. Perhaps it's a human condition. I can argue persuasively that it's certainly an American condition. We don't like to be wrong. We like to know what we're doing, we like to do it with consistent excellence. And the only thing we like less than being wrong is having to admit that we've made a mistake. Most of us are familiar with the Myers-Briggs type indicator, based on Carl Jung's psychological theories of personality type. I don't know about other professions, but the Myers-Briggs is a favorite vehicle in academic circles. It's usually used to provide a basis for some kind of professional development activity. I know that over my career, I have taken the full Myers-Briggs test at least three times. At its most basic, 
One's answers to the questions result in four scores that fall somewhere along the continuum between two binary folds. Probably the most familiar of those continuums is the relationship between extroversion and introversion. And none of you will be surprised that I consistently score no introvert points at all. <laughs> Clearly, I fall into the classification of extrovert. The last couple of times I've taken the test, though, the instrument, an analysis of our responses has produced subscores. And the professional development activity has asked us to look at the subscores that might appear to contradict the basic type. In my case, I consistently express a willingness to accept the possibility that more than one answer could be correct at the same time. I prefer to think about that as the possibility that I could be wrong. That's not to say that I'm unwilling to take and defend the position, or that I'm, not, I'm unable to make up my mind. It is more to say that I'm unwilling to defend my position to the point of demonizing or destroying somebody else. And I think that's one of Paul's points in this passage from 1 Corinthians. I don't think Paul is too worried about being wrong himself, about the reality of God versus the reality of ancient idols or deities. But he is worried about the consequences of his actions and the consequences of the actions of the members of his congregation in Corinth. He is worried about being so sure of our rightness and our righteousness that we take no heed for the other. At all. Which brings me to the question, how do I speak and how do I act in accordance with Jesus' command to love God and love neighbor? It's no secret that the church at Corinth was dysfunctional. Riddled with factions and disagreements, its witness within that ancient shifting center was confusing, to say the least. Paul's first epistle to the congregation is organized by answers to questions and challenges to ongoing problems. Today's reading comes from Paul's concluding words about eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. Perhaps one of the most confusing passages in the entire New Testament. And let's admit right now that that particular question doesn't come up very often in our daily life. I don't think if you go to Long's Point Steakhouse that you have to worry about whether the cow out back has been sacrificed to a particular deity except the deity of American Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> but even though we don't have to deal with meat offered to idols, and I have to confess as an aside here, as the parent of a vegan daughter, that last line in Paul's I will not eat meat at all may be the, the scripture passage for the vegan and vegetarian. The crux of Paul's argument is still vitally relevant today. That Christian action is and should be based on love and concern for the other. Not on our sense of or need to be right. We ought to be acting in order to build up each other rather than to make sure we are always correct. Paul leaves no question that that ritual sacrifice leaves no real residual taint of idolatry. Because, as he says, there are no idols. So if there are no idols, you don't have to worry about the meat that's been sacrificed to the idol. Unless, of course, you haven't gotten to the point where you believe there are no idols. And then you need to go see Carl Jung or one of his disciples after you get to that point. Because Paul makes it clear that acting out of our superior knowledge isn't always helpful and is rarely redemptive. Speaking in the light of God's revelation to us often requires that we walk a fine line, a narrow path. 
Our Christian journey is not easy, nor was it meant to be. And grounding our living in the command to love God and neighbor will rarely leave us with decisive answers or a clear dogma. Sometimes we know that faithful discipleship forces us to take a stance against prevailing cultural norms. But we are at our best when that stance is grounded in the love of God and the love of neighbor and characterized by humility. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble. Especially since our very seeking humility might be perceived as arrogant. It's even more difficult to be humble when we're part of a community that's privileged and in control. When we are so sure that our way is right, that any challenge is perceived as persecution. But I'm going to give it a go. The season of Lent is approaching with its constant reminders of our very true place in God's cosmos. If we're smart, we will embrace Lent and its call to confession and repentance as one way to enhance our discipline of humility. And we will work to turn our thoughts away from our own fear of being wrong to focus on loving God.
Well, thank you, Melinda and James and Keith, for bringing us that worshipful response to the sermon and continuing our praise this morning, our songs of praise. Thank you, Steve, for making us laugh and for making us reflect. And those are two of the holy things, I think. So thank you for bringing your full self. Reminding us of the lessons of humility. That's a good one to practice. This time in the service, I bring announcements and concerns, but one of the first announcements um, is going to be brought by Geneva Hall Shelton, who I asked to go ahead and make her way up to the lectern. Geneva is the chair of the Pastor Search Committee, and she'll bring bringing an announcement this morning. Welcome, Geneva. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am here, as Daniel said, I'm on behalf of the Pastoral Search Committee, um, which includes Karen Massey, Marie Cook, and Nancy Howley, Beth Blast, and Kathy Wooten, and Barbara Ashley. Um, we've been working hard uh, with the um, advisor from the Center for Healthy Churches, Joel Schneider, who uh, North Side Drive Baptist Church Personnel Committee uh, engaged and hired to serve as an advisor in our search. And through the process for from the Center for Healthy Churches, um, we recommended that we have three separate conversations as a congregation, assisted um, by Joel, around who we are as a church and where we're going. So the first of those conversations is coming up on February 11th. And again on February 13th, um, so hopefully one of those dates will work for you. Um, and we're going to be talking about Northside Drive's past, uh, how we got here, and what is our DNA as a congregation. From these three sessions, um, led by Joel, two products will emerge. We'll have a congregational profile and a pastor profile. And uh, when we have those two items, those that profile, those guidelines, then we'll be, begin to have the process of reviewing candidates. Um, and we're hoping that that timeline is around the early summer. So if you would, please join us for the first listening session. Um, it will be held via Zoom on Thursday, February 11th at 7.30 p.m. and Saturday, February 13th at 9.30 a.m. Um, the session content will be repeated, as I mentioned, so you can either join Thursday or Saturday, but don't need to attend both sessions. If any member does not have access to Zoom, um, we ask that they either call in at the phone number uh, listed in the pinnacle article, and they can join the session that way, or talk with their deacons, and we can um, create a separate session individually. Um, it's really, the process works best when we hear from everyone, so we really want to make sure everyone is included. Uh, and to give you an idea of what we'll be talking about in our first session, they've asked me to, to share a little bit about um, a personal story, as Pal did last week, um, to talk about what brought me here to Northside Drive and, and what kept me. Um, so my parents joined Northside Drive before I was born. So I grew up in the church, I was in the cheer choir, uh, Wednesday night suppers, I remember those. Um, I remember being in the nursery with Miss Flora, um, Bible Bills of Doc Houston. My first job was a counselor at the Dave Spring Summer Camp here. Um, I was in a youth group. I've been camping in the forest with Karen Massey. For those of you who know Karen Massey will appreciate um, that also been with her on hunger walks, raising money, building habitat houses. Um, so lots of history with the church. Um, I went away to college and I came back to, I lived abroad and um, when we started our family, came back to Atlanta to do that. So the reason that I came to this church may not have been my own choice, but the reason I decided to stay and raise my two children, Amelia and Sebastian, is really because of how we nurture each other here, that we're a family. I'll give you an example. So 42 years ago, um, when my mother was in 
new mom brought her baby home from the hospital, didn't know anyone in Atlanta, Susan Dew came to visit her and bring her love from the church. 30 years later, when I had my first child, Susan Dew again came to my, church, to my house to bring me in a, a gift and a hug uh, and a, a meal. This is the nurturing family of Northside Drive at work. Um, before COVID, uh, what I really loved about Sundays coming here and giving a big hug to Janet Bell, who was actually my um, middle school dance teacher. And I know that Amelia loves coming here on Sundays, and she's so good at the art projects at Miss Pantry. Um, she's over there building a skyscraper right now with marshmallows. Uh, and Sebastian really misses talking with Kathy Harris about their shared love of animals. Um, my children know that there are people outside of their family that love and cherish them. The nurturing nature of Northside Drive, this is why I'm here. And as a search committee um, and as a congregation, we want to hear that same thing from you as well. What brings you here and what makes you stay? And it's really important that we hear your story. So please, please um, join us at one of these listening sessions. Uh, the details, again, are in the pinnacle. So please um, take a look at that, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Geneva, for those words from heart and for your leadership in many hours of service as the chair of the Pastor Church Committee. I want to bring a few concerns and celebrations. Uh, we pray for those, there are some who are facing upcoming concerns and uncertain diagnosis in the future. We pray for them in the congregation. We also celebrate new life in the congregation. We have two new babies. I announced one last Sunday, two since then. Actually, last Sunday, a baby was born while I was announcing another one. Whitten Bright Blaisdell, born on January 24th to Andrew and Allie Blaisdell, who is the son-in-law and daughter to Bruce and Sylvia Dick. He goes by Wit. He doesn't know that yet, but he will. And big sister Wes is very excited and important. And then on January 26th, John Patrick Ellis was born, son to Northside Drive members Rebecca and Cameron Ellis. And I saw a wonderful picture of John Patrick being ill, cradled by a big brother, Beckett, and I'm sure that is going to form a lasting bond for those two boys. So we give thanks for this new life and pray for the family as I already prayed this morning. We take a moment to pause, wherever you're watching this one over it, and in fact, we can hit pause right now and give generously uh, to the congregation to help support the many ministries of Northside Drive Baptist Church. There's a giving tab at the top of our website. Check that out, or you can mail a check to the church office in lieu of our regular offering to the pandemic. There are some more opportunities to give uh, coming up. Super Bowl Sunday. Super Bowl Sunday will be next Sunday, February 7th. We're going to have a Zoom gathering at 1230. We'll be looking in the pinnacle that's coming out on Friday for that link. Kurt Thomas is going to play some music, and you're invited to make your favorite suit and just drop in for a few minutes or the entire hour if you have time to say hi to the community. But more than anything, we're, we are raising funds for the Hunger Fund. So we ask you to give generously that next Sunday for that Super Bowl. Be looking for details. Finally, another giving opportunity to let you know about. On February 10th, we are hosting with the American Red Cross and Blood Drive in our fellowship hall. That will be from 3 to 7 on February 10th. We need people to sign up uh, to help. Um, if, you're, if you, for any reason, can't get blood, we need volunteers. If you're willing to give blood, uh, sign up. And uh, if you can look on our Facebook page, there's a link to that. And as soon as the Internet's back, I'm going to put it on our website. Many, many things to be preparing for. Many service opportunities. We give thanks to God that we're in a congregation with so many rich opportunities. And now I want to call upon Dr. Steve Sheely to bring the benediction. Dear God, we are first. We 
we go out to be the people of God in a world that needs our presence. As we go, know this. By the power of God, you are brought into this world. By the grace of God, you've been kept all the days of your life, even until this very moment. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, you are being redeemed now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.